Richard PMI dynamic rope is the 10-2 spire, and it is 10.2 millimeter, 13 30 seconds. Uh, it is available in 60 meter and 70 meter lengths, and because of this webinar, as this being the featured rope, we have it discounted through June 15th, and it's just a special discounted price, and it is 30% off. So that price is available through our website and if you would call our customer service. So I'll go through all of the, you know, the links and phone numbers at the end so that you can get all of that. But it is available um, for 30% off until June 15th. It is USA made and certified to UIAA 101 and EN 892. And there's a table with some of the uh, other pertinent details. And this slide will also be available on the uh, website in the archive, so you can come back to this later if you'd like to. Our presenter today is Trask Bradbury. He is PMI Vertical Specialist. So without further ado, I will give it to Trask. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for showing up. My name is Trask Bradbury, and I am one of the PMI vertical specialists, and I'm a 38-year-old um, rope access tech by trade for my living. Uh, rope access tech, meaning um, we do a lot of uh, work in the inspection and repair, wind, oil, gas, petrochemical, bridges, dams, inspections, um, and we do it all hanging off of ropes. Uh, and um, so apart from taking all of my last 20 years of climbing in the mountains and, and on rocks, um, I, uh, I was able to find a niche in, in, the, in the world of making money doing something I really love. And PMI was a really integral part of that. Um, I was first trained at PMI's um, training branch, Vertical Rescue Solutions, VRS, and um, really learned that um, there was a lot more to ropes than just hanging off of them. Um, physics, forces, um, all kinds of interesting things. So I was really enthralled by it and uh, it's been a really fun life. So I recently just got engaged and um, Mary is uh, not with us but she was going to be on here and so I was just going to give her a shout out. Um, I got a dog named Sadie. She's our new puppy black lab and she's gorgeous. So uh, let's get on with our little slideshow. That was a little bit about me. Um, today we're talking about the 10.2 Spire by PMI. Um, and this is a really favorite rope of mine. I like working with one rope when I can. Uh, there's many ways of working with ropes, whether it's double ropes, twin ropes, half ropes, or single ropes. And um, I started climbing traditionally with, uh, with gear and cracks and, and just a rope. And it's the one style of climbing that's definitely stuck with me throughout these years. Um, and here you can see the Grasshopper 10.2 Spire sitting on a nice little picnic table with our gear nicely laid out before beginning a route uh, in the Black Canyon of the Gunnison, which is in Colorado. And um, it was a very fun route. Um, here is that route um, with my really good friend Eric Wellborn, who uh, taught me a lot about climbing and has certainly climbed a lot himself, one of the best climbers in the state. Um, and the topic of this uh, webinar is called Leading from Behind. Um, it's one thing that I firmly believe in. Uh, after growing up in an era that seems to be uh, going away quickly um, with all these um, climbing gyms popping up everywhere and, and uh, kids getting really good at climbing actually uh, very fast at a young age and going out with those extremely good skills into the wilderness and climbing themselves but without any really uh, field time um, and climbing in the wild and learning from experience uh, one thing that i had growing up was i hooked up with some older climbers and 
as a young, eager, naive climber, uh, I really, I wanted to climb everything, but I just didn't know all the little tricks of the trade and, and how to do things on, on the safer side. Um, my first climbing partner, who lasted a long time, uh, brought me to Devil's Tower in Wyoming and just basically said, here's the rack, go for it. And I climbed up the first pitch and set a belay. And fortunately for him, he didn't know what he was being belayed off of. But when he got up to me and he noticed some, some things with the anchor that could have been done a lot better, he basically educated me. And by being in the field and him teaching me what I should do and shouldn't do, uh, things were a lot easier to understand because you could see why you were learning it versus like learning something in a classroom. I've always been a hands-on learner and an experiential lear learner. Um, but that whole leading from behind concept goes a long way um, when you have a mentor who tells you that you can do it and believes in you and teaches you while you go. It gives you the confidence to go off and, and learn more. Um, here we have... Uh, a picture of my twin brother Slade climbing an ice route up on Pikes Peak here in Colorado Springs and you can see he's got two ropes by PMI tied to him um, these are much skinnier ropes these are uh, 8.1's but in ice climbing sometimes routes can meander from right to left and uh, it's good to clip one rope in one piece of gear while you clip the other rope and a piece of gear above it to keep the drag down so that you're not feeling these friction forces as you climb up and something is uh, if you climb up and there's a lot of friction it can feel like you're climbing up with sandbags hanging off your harness um, so there's a there's a certain um, amount of ropes for a certain style of climbing that you use um, here's one of my favorite shots I snapped of the grasshopper 10.2 spire on a on a a different route next to the last route on Pikes Peak, um, but nonetheless, it's a, a classic alpine route where there wasn't a lot of deviation, so we took one rope up with us. Um, now here's a, a shot in the Bugaboos up in Canada, and uh, actually this picture leads into my next Slide, slide regarding fall factors because as you can see I'm placing in a cam and if I were to fall out of that crack before that cam placement gets clipped you notice my last piece is probably 20 feet below me um, my fall would be 40 plus feet I would fall that 20 feet plus the 20 feet below that piece that I accrued going on the fall and then some stretch in the dynamic rope and uh, those falls generate a lot of force and there, there's um, a thing called fall factors in um, the industrial workforce that also somewhat pertain to the dynamic uh, tree climbing force and that is here we have a slide where you can see that there's a, a climber and you show the uh, anchor and if he's clipped to an anchor that's above him and he falls he's really not falling at all uh, so that's a fall factor of zero. But if he falls with an anchor that's clipped at his waist, he's going to fall quite a bit, and that would be a fall factor um, of one. Um, he's definitely going to feel some force on his body, especially when that harness cinches up and his lanyard catches. And then the last one, you can see that he's well above body length from his anchor, and if he falls, he falls double the length. That's called a fall factor two, and those are the worst kind. Now, this slide typically is for the industrial world where someone is tying to an anchor while walking on an I-beam or scaffold, and he's wearing a lanyard that has a shock pack in it. But uh, nonetheless, if you're 180 pounds and you fall five feet, that's going to be a lot of force generated on your body. Um, here is a shot uh, in Utah on some sandstone where you can see there's two ropes involved. But uh, the reason for this, not because the route meandered, but what, the reason for this was we chose the, uh, to make the descent off this tower in as little rappels as possible. 
so we decided to bring two ropes. Um, two ropes can be beneficial in a lot of ways, um, but, but one rope can be just as beneficial, especially if it's a 70 meter rope. Your standard rope out there is going to be 60 meters. If you really want to go to a 70 meter rope, you're probably looking at wanting to stretch your pitches together and also get the most out of your rappels. Um, but in the United States, for the most part, most of your climbs are going to be uh, 60, 60 meter rappels, um, which actually 30 meter rappels because you'll double up your 60 meter rope and uh, rappel off. So your anchors will be about 30 meters apart. That's pretty standard. Um, here's a slide of Turkey Rocks in the South Platte of Colorado on a really classic route. And, um, you know, there's not many places that you can, um, that you need anything other than a, a one rope. And what I like about the 10.2 Spire is the sheath um, is very tough and abrasion resistant. And if you're in a place like this, Turkey Rocks, the granite has got a lot of crystals on it. It's very sharp and abrasive. And typically the rope's going over that, whether it's a slope or it's an overhang, and um, that rope is going to wear down. The good thing about the sheath in, in regards to these ropes being kern mantle, uh, kern mantle meaning that there's a sheath, the kern, and then the mantle is the core. The sheath is just a... Um, woven nylon over the core, which is the true strength of a rope. And that is really what protects the core um, from getting damaged. And while you're climbing, if the sheath does get nicked, it's very obvious to the human eye. So it's pretty easy to inspect. And here's some climbing up in Canada in the Bugaboos. Um, another place where getting away with one rope is actually pretty easy. All the routes there are rock routes and um, they're very straightforward and um, the rappels are all very close together. So uh, when, you, when you're going into a place you can either bring twins or doubles but one rope is plenty you know and if the hikers carrying the rope and your other and your partners carrying the rack then that's a good way to divvy up uh, the loads in your in your uh, in your gear and then uh, there's another uh, shot of um, Yosemite high up on El Capitan we're um, doing the the free blast which is the first 10 pitches of the Salafe really classic route and uh, if anyone's been to El Cap they know that that place is littered with bolt stations and rappel stations and anchors everywhere Getting away with one rope there is very easy. One place I highly recommend 70 meter ropes though. Um, those really help you get to those places. And uh, here's a good shot of my friend Eric climbing in the Black Canyon on the Russian Arete. And uh, this is really convenient for the one rope style of climbing. And um, this is Utah here on an unnamed finger crack in the Indian Creek of Utah, which is a really classic place. And uh, this is where the 10.2 and a 70 meter is pretty much the quintessential rope. In the desert, you're going to be climbing routes uh, over and over again and setting up top ropes for friends. And one 70 meter rope in the desert will, will pretty much do every route there. And this is the ultimate rope for it. Um, here's one slide I put up that's uh, very interesting. You can see that the anchor is on the far left of the this, of this screen. And this is a really good slide for people that like to climb routes that have a lot of right turns and left turns and, and, and lower outs, you can actually see what kind of forces you're putting on the gear when you place it in the rock. All those gray ropes with the purple arrows on them, um, for your purposes, you can just make it, make it that those are your uh, pieces of equipment that you're placing in the rock, and you can see uh, what your forces are imparting on those anchors um, depending on your deviation. So if I am climbing 
straight out to the right and I clip a piece of gear and then I fall, I'm actually putting 141% of, lo of load on that piece of gear. Um, so my belayer would be the main anchor and then I would be the green arrow and then your piece of gear would be the purple arrow going up. Um, this is just an interesting graph to show you that um, just some of the things that are not really uh, taught in the climbing world that I picked up in the industrial rope access world where we're always statically hanging on static lines versus dynamic ropes and we're setting anchors and we're setting deviations. I decided to uh, disengage full screen so I could show my arrows here. Um, but yeah, going back to uh, kind of taking some of the things I've learned in rope access and brought them into the climbing world again are things like this, deviation forces. Um, as you can see, the main anchor is here, and then we have these acting as anchors, deviation anchors. And then we have the green and orange slash what peach colored ropes acting as our rope and the forces it's going to be pulling on depending on its angles. So like top roping, a climb, you go from a belayer or maybe even a physical anchor and someone's just operating the belay up and through an anchor and down back to the ground. Um, if there was any big real fall with some slack, that anchor is seeing 200% of the load and you can actually see what that anchor is seeing in load force as the deviation angle cuts down. Um, this is something that definitely uh, woke me up uh, to a lot of the climbing situations even I myself have been into um, and fortunately did not uh, weight that deviation anchor i.e. fortunately I did not fall. Um, ignorance is bliss sometimes, that's for sure. Uh, but it certainly makes me think twice now about my, you know, plugging in a stopper or a cam in some, uh, in some cracks when I'm mo moving to the right or to the left and looking at facing a fall. Now certainly using a dynamic rope uh, definitely helps in situations like this. And this is the only place where you would use one in climbing. Um, but yeah, deviation forces, this is something that's, that happens a lot out in the mountains that um, I certainly didn't used to think about but do now. Um, here's an example um, of a deviation force. So I showed this slide earlier, this is at Turkey Rocks. Now I'm going to go up this crack and then this is an overhanging roof crack here. So if I were to place a cam in that crack and then climb up above it but then fall, I'm really going to be, oh, sorry guys, it's my uh, Mac telling me my batteries are low on my trackpad. Uh, anyway, um, those cams are going to be uh, seeing quite a bit of force. Um, here's a classic shot of um, Vedavu, Wyoming, on my one of my favorite routes called Horn's Mother. Uh, one of the old climbing books used to have it as their cover shot, Horn's Mother, and uh, it's one of my favorites. A really wide crack with really good gear and a couple of good rests on it. Um, and I was saying earlier, this is another place uh, we're having a really burly um, single rope is going to go a long way. A 70 meter 10.2 spire is, is the best for this type of place. All the routes are pretty straightforward. Um, you sometimes need a long 70 meter rope to rappel off to the bottom or multiple rappels. And uh, you're certainly going to want a sheath that's going to stand up to the test of time on this sharp granular granite out there at Vedavu. And can't think of anything but the 10.2 spire, 70 meter for sure. Um, here we've got um, my good buddy Eric again on, on another shot on some ice. Um, you know, this is a whole other one of those leading from behinds. You know, he taught me a lot about ice climbing along with my very first uh, climbing partner. Um, but he was definitely very encouraging um, and not too, not too uh, overwhelming with knowledge on what to do 
Um, it was one of those guys that uh, just made you feel like you could do it. And um, just by him being there and giving you that presence, encouraged you to go for it and get after it. Um, another one of those leading from behind aspects that went a long way with me growing up and, and getting into climbing, um, having that mentor. Um, classic ice climb in Colorado Springs uh, that doesn't uh, um, really see a lot of years with ice on it, but uh, this is nonetheless a really good one in a hidden area of Colorado Springs. Um, static rope, much different than, than climbing dynamic rope. Um, this is a shot of me over the Colorado, just downstream from the Hoover Dam as we were inspecting the, the bypass bridge over the Hoover Dam. And uh, one thing we all know about dynamic ropes is that there's a lot of stretch in them. And if you were to try to ascend on a dynamic rope using the old classic, you know, Jumars, then you'd be bouncing up and down a lot and losing a lot of that energy and losing a lot of that distance. So in rope access, we use static and static only for our work. Now there's a lot of varieties of static. There's low stretch, um, there's isostatic, and there's a lot of different fabrics that go into these static ropes that make them either extremely durable and and uh, with very minimal stretch or a lot of stretch, even though they're static. Um, but nonetheless, this is a static rope that you wouldn't see get used much in the climbing world. When I first started growing up into, the, uh, into wall climbing, um, everything we used, we wanted it to be dynamic except for the haul line. The haul line that was gonna haul your, um, your gear up the wall you wanted it to be static because you didn't want to lose all that energy and all that distance when you were hauling 600 pounds of gear up a wall. Um, but you certainly wanted your lead rope to be dynamic and you certainly wanted your anchor cordelette to be dynamic. Anything that can absorb a shock or would possibly see a shock, uh, a shock load. Um, now in rope access, we use static because we try to mitigate any type of hazards. Um, that would make it see a shock load. So you see we have two ropes in this shot and we have two ropes in rope access uh, for the redundant safety factor. We have a main working line which is always under load and always seeing the static pressure. And then we have a safety line that is kind of, it's there, we have a safety attached to it, but it's out of sight, out of mind, and it's as a backup just in case there was a main line failure. Um, now attached to that safety line we will have some dynamic features attached to our harness so that if there was a mainline failure and we were to take more than a one six inch, one foot, two foot fall, we absorb energy and we don't, we don't get that energy shock loading our bodies and um, possibly breaking bones or breaking your back or uh, hurt damaging some organs. Um, and also we use uh, full size, full body harnesses. Um, so the load is distributed over our whole body versus just our waist, like our climbing harnesses. Um, now here's a shot up in Bugaboos, again, on a different route, on a different formation. And you can see that place has got uh, everything from crevasses to some ice lines, uh, but it's typically a rock climbing area, just a high alpine rock climbing area. Uh, another really great place to get away with, uh, with your one rope techniques. Um, Again, I said earlier, this is a perfect place for a 70 meter. Um, let's see, here's a shot, again, on Pikes Peak, Colorado Springs, uh, on the Bigger Bagger Formation. And this was taken a while ago. Uh, another place that you're really gonna wanna get away with a single rope, uh, but you want something a little lighter than the 11 mil, so the 10.2 spire, once again, coming in super handy. Here's a good shot on uh, outer space in El Dorado Canyon, um, just outside of Boulder. This is an ultra classic route with some, uh, with some traverses on it, but if you put some runners on it and protect it well, then you can really get away with just one rope, no need for two. Um, 
I put this one in here even though it's rope access because um, this is an exact example showing in this picture of how you can inspect your rope very thoroughly and quickly. Um, we all know what rope feels like. It's, um, it's soft, it's kind of squeezy, but you can feel that there's a, a solid core structure to the rope. And so every time you pull an arm's length of rope in between your two hands, you're looking at it with your eyes, but also one of your hands is squeezing two fingers along the rope as it's going through. Um, and if you do that really quickly, it doesn't take much to feel any type of core damage or break or imperfect, uh, imperfections in that rope if you do it correctly. And so every time I get done climbing, even in the uh, outdoors, rocks and ice, um, unlike rope access, I'm still, every time I coil my rope at the end of a climb or flake it out for a new climb, that's the perfect time to inspect your rope. Uh, you, would, you would be surprised how many times I've actually found pretty hair-raising features to a rope out in the field with some friends climbing. Um, and, you know, they've been using that rope forever, and they're so attached to it. And coming from the knowledge that I have about core, uh, core mantle, you know, sheath and core ropes, um, it definitely raises a question in my head as to why it's still even in use. Uh, it doesn't take much for a rope after a core damage um, has been imparted on it for it to break. Uh, maybe it's just one fall away from failure, but I certainly don't want to be on that rope if it's only one fall away from failure. So inspection is really key on these ropes. And like I said, it's really easy. I mean, as much as it takes you to flake a rope out on the ground, you're inspecting it while you're doing that. It's very fast. One arm's, rope of, one arm's length of rope, uh, you can see it going through, so you're looking for any type of fraying or discoloration or anything that's with a sheath. And then with your two fingers on it as it's sliding through, you can actually feel very quickly as it's going through any type of imperfections, whether it be something that feels like a BB or something that feels like the core has been shot, uh, it's got flattened out, uh, maybe even the sheath is starting to milk up on the core. And there's a whole bunch of sheath kind of bundled up, and it looks like a wrinkled sheath. That's, uh, that's something you want to look at, too. Um, so that's it on my uh, presentation for the 10.2 Spire. Uh, I made it kind of quick, and that's how I like things. So let's open it up to any questions. All right, if there are any questions, you can type them into the chat slash questions section of your control panel, and um, we will get to them as we go. So there is one question. Um, is there ever a time when you have used dynamic rope in rope access? Uh, yes. Can, should I type it or hear it? Or speak uh, you it? can speak it. OK. Yeah, there are times where you use dynamic rope in rope access, and that would be if you need to go anywhere that doesn't have uh, anchors installed already and that you cannot get to uh, via aid climbing or rope access. So let's say you're climbing um, a MET tower, a radio tower, or maybe you're on the side of a bridge that's truss, and you need to traverse that bridge, and as you traverse it, you're looking at uh, a fall. Um, you would definitely want to go out there with a belayer and a dynamic rope and you could sling the structure as you're going and clip into it just like you're uh, out in the rocks climbing. It's, uh, it's only industrial climbing. So there are actually times where dynamic rope is used in rope access. Okay. And that is the only question we have so far. So um, I'm gonna, we can still leave it open for questions while I wrap it up. Um, so if you have one that um, you'd like to get answered during the presentation, you can go ahead and type it in and um, we'll still get to it. So let me switch back to my screen. Okay, you should be able to see my screen momentarily. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if you have further questions for Trask, you can email him at the email shown on your screen. It's bradbury620 at gmail.com. And the PMI Dynamic Webinar Series hosts these webinars frequently, so you can keep an eye on the PMI Dynamic website for future dates and topics. Uh, it's the website shown on your screen there. It's pmidynamic.com slash webinar. A recording of this webinar, along with the webinar slides, will be available within 24 hours at the link above. And remember that all 10 Spire ropes are 30% off until June 15th. So you can visit pmidynamic.com slash products slash 102-spire or call 1-800-282-ROPE and you can get uh, your 10 Spire for 30% off until June 15th. And for news and updates about future webinars and other stuff going on, um, you can follow Trask and PMI on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the addresses shown on your screen. And we don't have any other questions, so we'll go ahead and finish it up. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We hope that it was helpful. Apologize for the technical difficulties we had, but we hope that it was informational and you enjoyed it. And thank you very much, Trask, for presenting. Thanks.